Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Diversity in the Arts, a conference hosted and presented by Overture with the Arts. Uh, today's discussion will be with two fantastic artists from two different um, genres or fields. And we will be looking at how diversity is presented and also the impact of diversity in the arts. So I want to welcome Omari Newton uh, to the stage. And I'd also like to welcome Malia Suchan. So I want to start off by giving you guys the opportunity to talk about yourselves. Tell us a little bit about your background. And then we'll get into how you got bitten by the bug of the arts. So let's start with Omari. Oh, um, so I am a professional actor and writer. Starting off as an MC, I used to rhyme when I was like eight years old. I wrote my first protest song it was a, a hip hop song about recycling. Uh, and I just it's just always something that I was good at. And then I, I did a play in high school and an agent was in the audience. And after the play, I asked if I'd ever thought about doing this for a living. And I truly, I didn't know that being a professional actor was a thing that you could do. Like I knew that you know in Hollywood there was actors, but I didn't, I didn't understand anything about like local markets. So I got my first agent when I was, I guess it was 16, 17, and been acting ever since. And can you tell us a little bit about your personal background? Um, mm -hmm. Who is Omari Newton before oh, wow. the bite of the bug? Oh wow! I mean, I was I was always someone who like I loved. I would like watch <laughs> cartoons with my sisters and like try to copy voices of characters on TV. Uh, Although, it's funny, when I was born, I had um, polyps on my vocal cords. So I, you know those kids who, oh, like, yeah, that voice. When I was a little kid, I used to speak like this. And I remember I had an, a nurse once tell me, uh, I, I, mentioned I had surgery to remove the polyps, and a nurse was like, yeah, your voice sounds much better, but you'll never be able to be like an actor or a singer. But other than that, you should be able to live like a pretty normal life. It was like in grade three. So in your face, nurse from Greendale. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you have to prove it wrong. Yeah, that's right. So really, this entire thing is about vengeance. I'm just on a path of vengeance, much like, um, like Uma Thurman and Kill Bill. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> Melina, to you now. Uh, tell us about yourself and when you got bitten with the bug of being a songstress, I assume. Okay, so basically, I was put into piano when I was really young, uh, four years old. And that's where I was first exposed to music. But I was doing just, you know, classical piano. That's what all the kids do when they're, you know, young. Um, but I started writing songs when I was about 11, 12. I started writing my first little piano tunes. And I would show them all secretively to my parents, my grandparents. And they used to encourage me with that. Um, but I never wanted to sing, actually. I, I actually thought I had a terrible voice. So I want to try to find someone else to sing my songs. The only reason I started singing is because nobody would sing my songs. So <laughs> I basically started singing my own tunes. Um, and it became just a way for me to express myself when I was a teenager. Um, I went through many styles, many phases, grunge rock, you know, uh, R&B stuff, you name it. Um, and then basically, I actually ended up going to university in piano at McGill. And that's where I realized people do actually make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing is that I don't think McGill prepared me for an actual life in, you know, for real as an artist. I really learned how to make a living off of it after university, just by being involved with the community. And ever since then, I've been doing that. Well, it's an interesting piece that you both mentioned that it seems as though there was a journey through mm -hmm. your art. So, you know, yourself, obviously, on your path of vengeance, but also, you know, through <laughs> cartoons and hip hop, eventually then decided to become an actor and a playwright. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, going through different genres. So, mm -hmm. again, when do you? figure out your, your groove, or when do you find that, that niche or that space as an artist that goes, okay, this is what I'm great at and this is what I'm gonna be doing going forward? Hmm. Well, I, a big turning point for me was, so I, I did theater in college. Uh, John Abbott has this great program called Theater Workshop where no matter what program you're in, you can do plays. And I thought to myself, you know, this theater thing is really fun. So I'll do this in college, and then I, I got into communications at Concordia, and I was like, I'll do my degree in communications, and then you know, the acting stuff will be something for fun. And then there's a company called Black Theatre Workshop in Montreal, and they cast me as uh, their lead actor in, in 1999. I was a lead actor in two of their plays for the season. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time, like, all I did that year was act for money. And it was the first time I was like, oh, like, this is a real thing that you can do. So I, I guess around 99, 2000 was when I, I started taking it, like, quite seriously as a profession. Okay. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, um, like I said, after university, yeah. um, I actually sort of 
hooked up with a song and dance troupe called Les Belushes Girls. Mm. And that was my first exposure to you know, stage, theater, dance, um, cabaret style. I got hired to do singing part, but eventually I also, they also wanted me to do dancing, and there was costumes, there was a whole showbiz mm. thing. And that's when I started realizing, like, there's actually work in this. Um, but I mean, I was still working you know, odd jobs here and there because it wasn't paying quite all the bills. Mm. Um, but I started to realize that there were people who made a living doing this kind of thing. And at the same time, that's when I started um, sort of getting involved with the community, the music community in Montreal. I joined a few bands, started getting some stage experience, um, open mics here and there, and it just started to pick up little by little. I kind of fell into a jazz world, though. And so it's really interesting because most people, if they've never heard me at all, they see me as a jazz artist. But really, I've gone through so many different styles, I can't even <laughs> name them for you, and I'm still exploring to this day. Wow. Yeah. Well, that was actually it's a great segue to my next question. I mean, usually, traditionally, when we look at uh, people from ethnocultural communities, we often assume the type of music or art that they would produce, right? It would be um, it's an assumption that you would perhaps be involved in hip hop, or if the type of movies or position, or I guess, roles that you would want to play would be very stereotypical. Mm -hmm. um, guessing the type of genre, I guess people would assume where you would land. What is that like in the, in the artist world, um, being in what is not traditionally what people would apply to you mm -hmm. uh, or would assume that you would be interested in? I, I started writing as a direct response to exactly that. Like, I, it was, it's funny, on stage and when I do cartoon voices, I get to do a vast array of characters. But in film and TV, especially as a young black actor, there was a lot of like, you know, thug number one, gangster number two. My, actually, on IMDb, my, my literal first credit is slave number two in a movie. That's literally the first job I ever got. So I was like, at some point, if you have any self-respect, you get over that. And I, I started writing because I was like, I want to write the play that I wish I could have been in or that I could have seen on stage. So yeah, it's, it, it can be frustrating sometimes, but luckily, if you have a voice, or, you know, there's platforms where you can get your voice out there on your own. Um, it's interesting because in my genre, so I'm going to call jazz my genre, okay. even though I have many genres, but let's say in the jazz world in Montreal, there is literally two Asian women, okay? There's, this, there's a lady named Carolyn Fay, she's fabulous, she's a, she's a, blues, um, a blues jazz singer, and then there's myself, I guess I identify with that, even though I'm only half Chinese. Um, but, you know, people just, actually people don't really know what jazz looks like anyway, right. in a way, um, but they are curious. Mm -hmm. And if I'm on stage, they are curious about that. Um, but it's interesting that you say stereotyping because <laughs> one of the gigs that I had once, um, I was hired by an agent who books for the casinos, okay? And there was gonna be a, a launch for a new slot machine. And the slot machine you know, was based on the Chinese New Year. And she was like, oh, I know exactly the right artist to, per to perform at the launch of this Chinese New Year slot machine. She's like, I need, I need an Asian jazz singer. <laughs> so she calls me and I'm like, okay, that's a bit of a weird one, but it's money, so yeah. okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so I said yes, and then she's like, oh, can you do any Chinese music? I'm like, I'm a jazz singer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same. And she's like, really, not a single one? Sorry, yeah. no. Oh. But I'll do jazz, and I guess I look Chinese. So is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> is that enough? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that was that was one of the things. I mean, as far as being an artist and being an artist of color, um, then sometimes I, I assume there's a balance to be made. It's between taking the role that they're offering you and that check, because right. we know that developing a career in artistry it, it it's sometimes a very long, high, you know, steep road. So have you been put, you've given an example of, a, of an awkward scenario, <laughs> but uh, you took the job though. I took the job. You made that money. Okay. Yeah. And Omari, do you have a, a similar story other than, you know, slave number two? I'm sure that was hard. Yeah. Well, to be honest with you, at the time I was 19. It was my first gig. Like Vanessa Williams was the lead. I was stoked. Okay. Like I wasn't, at the time I wasn't thinking in terms of like bigger picture. I was like, I get to be in a movie with Vanessa. Right. It was only like as an adult now looking back being like, that's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but like, I don't know, I, I'm, a, I'm a very political artist, but there's this great quote by Bell Hooks, and Bell Hooks says that all art is political, and artists who don't think they're political, it's because they're doing art that supports the status quo, right? So 
I, I always thought to myself, like, as a black man and an artist, the lens I see the world through is that of a, an oppressed person or that of a, a marginalized person. So art that I create, whether I want to or not, is going to be speaking for more than just myself. You know, I don't know if that answered. Did I just duck your question? You did no. I, it, it, no, it, it, it shapes the your understanding of of person balancing art, right? right. Which is uh, which is really the the source of a of, of an artist. You guys are conduits, right? And and what comes out yeah. is often things that people maybe are thinking or feeling. So, and to, to just directly answer your question, mm -hmm. yes, I've definitely taken gigs just for a check. <laughs> but, I think every artist has. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well. I want to talk a little bit about your influences, like people who influenced your art, um, people that made you say, not only I can do that, but I see myself in that. We know that in terms of representation in the arts, um, sometimes the reflection, uh, depending on the type of genre you're in, can be challenging. I, I'm just curious to know um, who, who inspired or influenced you and, and did it happen or not happen to be someone who looked like you? Uh, for me, you know, I play piano and I'm a singer. So all the female you know, singer-songwriters of the 90s, coming up in the 90s would have been my inspiration. Um, Alicia Keys was a big inspiration. I don't think I necessarily look like, well, maybe some people say I look like her, strangely. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I think she's a big inspiration. I actually met her once uh, when I went to New York, mm -hmm. back when she had her first single. Right. I was participating in a talent show, which was actually a very, uh, very turnkey part of my life, mm -hmm. because um, it was uh, promoting youth in arts. Oh, so, um, yeah, and she was the guest performer mm. at that event, which was great. Uh, so anyway, so Alicia Keys, um, Amanda Marshall, Sarah McLaughlin, mm -hmm. Canadian female singer-songwriters. Okay. But I can't say that I necessarily uh, related to how they looked because can, I don't know a single Asian or half-Asian right. Canadian singer-songwriter, pianist. So I can't think the, of one right now. It is more the feminine it's aspect. It is the feminine aspect, yeah. yeah. Uh, and just the piano, right. and just the timing of it. Okay. And I guess the subject that they talk about, too. Hmm. Anybody influence you? Yeah, I, I was really lucky in that the time that I came up as an artist was an amazing time. It was the golden era of hip hop. So like, it's wild to think now that like, Public Enemy was a mainstream group, mm -hmm. or like Rage Against the Machine, or, or you know, people like KRS-One, Mos Def, Tribe Called Quest. So I was lucky. My, my parents uh, were very encouraging of me getting into uh, hip hop culture, and they would do these sneaky things. Like I had the the autobiography of Malcolm X children's book that I read when I was like nine or ten, okay. which then led me to be interested in reading the Alex Haley full book. And my my dad's the one who bought me Public Enemy's album. My dad's the one who and my, and my mom were like, "You should watch this Spike Lee movie." Oh. So it was I was always sort of influenced by black culture. Mm -hmm. I was lucky. Okay, fantastic. Um, it's a perfect segue. So you're the, the, the culture of the families that you come from, does it or how does it influence your art? I think uh, when we look at diversity, and regardless of the genres that we choose, we bring ourselves to the table. So how do you think the cultures of your families or your parents influence the artists that you are? Uh, well, so I come from a quite diverse household. <laughs> Uh, my dad is Chinese, but he was born in Trinidad. Oh. And my mom is Romanian from Romania. So I had sort of the West Indian and Eastern European mashup um, mash yeah. at my house. <laughs> um, so it was interesting because the both sides, I guess both, it was more, I guess, uh, the Chinese culture and the Romanian culture would have wanted to put me into piano, like mm. all good, you know, <laughs> kids from the West Island. Yes. Um, and, um, and that was great, but they, while they were very encouraging of me being creative and you know, learning piano and all this stuff, uh, I don't necessarily feel like they were encouraging of me building a career towards music. And the way this played out, though, is interesting because in the end, it was really just me sort of holding myself back. It took me, I think it took me about 10 years mm -hmm. to really believe in myself to really build a, a real career in it. Wow. So I wasn't, you know, directly out of school doing music full time. I had jobs, I had day jobs, you know, right. for a long, long time. Um, and it's not their fault or anything, but it's just that I think because I was surrounded, and neither of them are artists, by the way. Oh, okay. Neither is my brother. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, the only artist in the family <laughs> and, you know, trying to do this thing and they're supportive, but, you know, <laughs> don't, don't be a full time musician. Are you going to really make money doing that? 
So anyway, but they've come around now that they finally see me making money, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Hold on and believe, parents. Yeah, that's yes. it. Uh, I had bizarrely progressive parents who were basically like, get a degree. That was their thing. They were like, get a degree in anything. I, we don't care if it's basket weaving. We don't care if it's juggling. Get a degree. Very lucrative career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a huge market, by the way. If you yeah. want to start like an Etsy store. No, that's not true. <laughs> yeah, my parents were like, get, get a degree in, in something and then do whatever you want. Because right. they realized, I think they over told me like as a black man and as a black person in North America, you don't want to be that dude who wakes up at age 40, who your career is not going the way it wants and you got a high school diploma only to fall back on. So. Mm. And I'm glad they told me that because there was a time in my life where I was like, yeah, I want to be an actor. I'm going to move to Hollywood. And had I done that, it would have been a rough go right now. Mm. Not that I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm making dozens of hundreds of dollars. I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that. I really, really wanted to ask that question because um, the balance that parents have um, in terms of whether they're, they migrated to this country um, and they have a vision for what the gifts are that they want to give their children and the, the chances and the advancement. And uh, you know, saying the word art in some homes is like pretty much blasphemy. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you are throwing our dream away, child, not too much <laughs> anything else. So I thought it was important to look at that because when we talk about diversity in the arts, we also have uh, kind of like a collective uh, consciousness around how do we let our children explore who they are, mm -hmm. but at the same time prepare for the world that they're gonna face. So do you have any advice? I don't know if either of you are parents, um, but do you have any advice for parents who may have you know, a gifted Melina or a gifted Omari at home, but are like, mm, the arts. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I actually am surrounded by kids all the time. I'm a piano teacher now, okay? And um, one of the things that I think is really critical for parents to understand is you have to let your kids explore. Mm -hmm. You have to give them the opportunity, yeah. you know, from the earliest age possible. Just let them try a bit of everything and see what they gravitate towards. And this whole notion that you can't make a career in art, we're blowing that out the water now. You know, these days, who has a normal career anyway? You know, everyone changes their career every five, 10 years in any case. Right. Whatever you prepared for in university is probably not gonna be relevant in 10 years after that. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to keep on learning, you have to keep on building yourself and art is one of those ways. And I think today we're in a very interesting time in, in history, mm -hmm. because I think today people can make their own careers yes. with the help of YouTube, technology, um, everything. You can get your, if you're a musician, you get your music out yourself. You don't have to rely on these, you know, record labels to come and discover you anymore. Correct. That doesn't happen anymore, yeah. right? <laughs> today you're self publishing, and so if you have the right business sense, you can make yourself a career in the arts. It's not a dirty word anymore. No. no. Yeah, and I think. People will follow their heart regardless. Mm. So you may as well be nurturing and encouraging. And I mean to use an analogy, it's like, we all know that person who's dating someone that we're not down with. And you don't want to be that person who's like, yo, like, your man smells, like he doesn't shower, he's kind of dumb. And then they get married and you're like, oh, awkward. And you're not invited <laughs> to dinner. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. So if your kid has some talent for art, encourage them and be nurturing, like be realistic, but mm -hmm. you don't want to be that person who's on the wrong side of their dream once they pursue it anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. I have um, two questions that I, I thought of for both of you. I'm going to start with Melina. Mm -hmm. um, Lena Simone mm -hmm. uh, referred to jazz as being black classical music. Mm -hmm. And uh, she felt as though um, that artistry or the, the, the genre of jazz mm -hmm. was never given its proper due. Um, in its birthplace, the United States. Mm -hmm. um, now that you are actively a jazz singer in, in Montreal and I'm probably connected to this jazz world uh, across the world, um, what do you think the people's perspective is or, or how does the world look at jazz music? Hmm. That's a good question. Actually, I do, I, I interpret a lot of Nina Simone songs as well. So, um, I think, I think people view jazz as the reaction to classical music. And when we say classical, we say we mean Western European classical, because right. that's always historically been what people think of when they hear classical music. Um, and in people's general mind, I think there was no music before classical or outside of classical. Mm -hmm. And between classical and jazz, there was no other music. Right. Most people, right. I would, I would yes. think. Um, and 
j but jazz, because jazz sprung from the classical world in a way, I mean, it was influenced by, I suppose, but had its own roots, mm -hmm. right? Um, and from the jazz came everything that we know today. Right. You know, funk, Motown, R&B, soul, pop, rock. Right. All of this comes from jazz, yeah. the American jazz movement. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, jazz is, was the way for, I guess, North America to put its sort of stamp on the world. You know, classical music came from Europe, Europe. Yeah. and jazz came from North America, and it's, and everything else that's sprung up since then is thanks to that. But I'm not sure if everybody knows that. I, that's yeah, I'm talking. not sure everybody that's why knows that. I asked that. the question. Yeah. I said, if I'm going to sit with the jazz singer, she's going she gonna to give it to him. So that's yeah. My question for you, sir. Being on stage in theater and the, the roles that are often given to you, people tend to filter it through the characters through a particular color whether we like it or not. When we read certain bills, when we read certain plays, we say, this should be played by x man, and what the description that follows. Uh -huh. What has been your experience in breaking through that barrier to say, even though typically this play was written, the character is written as a white male or, or anybody of any, uh, of any particular demographic, I can play that role and I can make the audience see me uh, take on that role. What has been your experience or have you seen that challenge? Well, see, this is an interesting one because I'm kind of bizarrely arrogant in the, in the sense that I spent a lot of many years trying to fit into the mainstream model of theater to the point where, you know, my last, well, not my last, but I, I did a, a major theater gig in Vancouver at this company called Bard on the Beach that does Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a six month contract and I played one of two black characters in all of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. who was one of this, this evil villain, this guy named Aaron. And the company I found had a lot of issues with systemic racism, uh, they didn't really understand black culture. Mm -hmm. And I had this revelation while I was on stage one night doing this monologue, playing this character I didn't care about, where I was like, I can make more money working at Starbucks and keep my soul without <laughs> doing this, right? So I took it, to, this was 2008, yeah. and I took a 10 year break from acting on stage. I just returned to it last year. So my thing is this, I am not at all interested in breaking boundaries and like, I know this is for a white guy, but I can do this too. I don't care, I'm like, keep it. Mm -hmm. Keep your stupid role. I can write. Right. I can produce. I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And I know that some actors, they desperately want, uh, you know, mainstream approval and their dream is to be at Stratford. But who, I mean, I don't want to live in Stratford, Ontario. <laughs> what am I, you know what I mean? I know that's like the mecca of Shakespeare, but I have no interest whatsoever. Right. I would rather do plays that speak to my own people, for my own people, in a world that understands my culture and is populated by people of my culture. So that's my advice is turn your nose on those people and write your own stuff. Okay. Great. Back to both of you. Mm -hmm. The arts and entrepreneurship. Sometimes we assume that if you're gifted on one side, you may not, or people may assume you're not gifted on the other. But as you alluded to, um, that business savvy is now almost necessary Absolutely. to be able to navigate and to propel your art. Mm -hmm. So give me a little bit about your backgrounds in becoming, you know, artist entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, I, I've always been very interested in, in business and entrepreneurship. I actually have an MBA from, uh, from Concordia, um, wow. <laughs> which, which, is, which is funny because now, <clears throat> so at the time when I did the MBA, I was like thinking I'm going to change careers because at that time I was thinking music is maybe not for me, mm. strangely, okay. but it ended up pulling me right back in though. <laughs> it's so funny how, we're, how life works. Um, but no, I think entrepreneurship is very important. And, uh, you know, for me, I actually... One of the projects that I had started um, back in 2009 and 10 and 11 was a series of shows for singer-songwriters in Montreal. It was called Acoustic Nights Montreal. Oh, I heard and that. it was, you did? Yes. Awesome, I did my job. <laughs> um, and what it was was basically I was gathering um, artists, individual artists from around the city who wanted to showcase their material, who you know, may not have enough like, fan base to fill out a whole room, but if you bring four or five Pull people together. into the same room, everybody brings their fan base, and everybody discovers new music that That's way. Right. And the whole idea was to um, perform their own songs, cre their creative originals, and so on. That ended up morphing into, um, into a competition for, for musicians, but I decided to make it for young people. So it was you know, 13 to 18 year olds who were singer-songwriters, who were shy, maybe don't have a lot of stage experience at all. And, um, and that, was, that was a whole other endeavor. And I had to learn a lot 
you know, very grassroots trying to pull my own, you know, strings um, to try to make, get this off the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, interestingly, there wasn't that much support financially from the grant systems. Mm -hmm. right. So at the time, I was very discouraged. Um, but that's where I got the best training because I learned how to make a tiny budget work. You know? to hustle. That's it. <laughs> and that was actually one of the reasons I decided to do an MBA. I'm like, there's got to be a way to do this. Right. There's got to be a way to, to merge business and art so that arts are not just a drain on, on the system or on the finances and that it becomes one you know, together. Because mm -hmm. that's the way that it can be self-supportive is if it can make money and if people see the value in it. And it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Right. Sustainability. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I think uh, financial literacy is essential. I think it's a political act for artists of color. Mm -hmm. You hear all these horror stories about, I mean, whether it's pro athletes or pro artists getting pimped by their labels or getting mm -hmm. pimped by producers, and there, there's really no excuse. Like, literally, like, I taught myself about personal finance from YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I recognize this was something that was important, and I, I'm not rich by any means, but my wife and I were able to buy a place in Vancouver, which is the most expensive city in Canada, mm -hmm. You know, just basic stuff like knowing about RSPs and tax deductions, tax-free savings account. Like, mm -hmm. it, people find that this is boring stuff, and I, I feel like it's almost systemically people keep you systemically ignorant as a person of color because if you're ignorant, you could be controlled. So I think mm -hmm. it, it is essential for people to understand not only their business but tax law in the city they live in and just financial literacy. And I'm not trying to find like I always knew these things. Right. It was sometime in my like late twenties where I recognized. If I ever want to own stuff, i got to figure this out. Right. Okay. I want to do rapid fire with mm -hmm. you guys. Um, so I'm going to spit out there and you tell me what you prefer. Okay? So big stage versus little stage. Little stage. If I'm producing big stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, your own pieces or covering pieces mm. in your case? acting in the role of my own your all own? day yeah mm -hmm. mm, that's a hard, that's that's really 50 50 for me okay. yeah because yeah. if i get a good reaction from uh, covers i don't mind doing covers in my own way yeah okay. um completely autonomous or backed by a major label or company backed it would be nice mm -hmm. <laughs> partnerships are dope but I'm not interested in working for people. I'm interested in working with people. Okay. Um, television or the silver screen? Television or? The silver screen, movies. Uh, in what capacity? You acting <laughs> on television. Did you prefer acting in television or in movies and films? And for yourself, would it be Place something of interest? Vision. Yeah, to be involved, to be involved in a movie, either score writing or um, TV go, series would be TV great. series. That's that's the way of the future. Okay. For music placement in TV series. Mm -hmm. TV series, and I'll explain why. A TV series has unlimited potential. If you land on something like The Big Bang Theory, they're in season twelve right now. Right. A movie is a four week shoot and it's done. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage most artists you want to break into TV because it's it's limitless, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Canadian platform or international platform. International. International. If International. possible, absolutely. Yeah. Put Canada on the map. Canadian platform yeah. is an oxymoron. Is it? Explain. There's, the, there's no, you cannot really be a sustainable, viable artist with only reach in Canada. Every single majorly successful Canadian artist goes to the States or goes internationally. Okay. We, we have a, a Except great, for Gregory Charles. Mm. <laughs> that's an entirely different conversation. <laughs> But we also, can have that conversation. I mean, they're too. purple unicorns, right? But I under, but that's why I threw it out there. I wanted to, to Isn't understand. Isn't that homeboy who was defending blackface? On... That's a completely different conversation. Yeah, You're absolutely that, correct. But I that, was, I'm just that saying. We can have conversation, but. <laughs> so, some people prefer to be a big fish in a small pond. Some people want to take their chance as a small fish in a huge pond. So it just, it depends on your comfort level. Some people, you know, will sing at the cheers across Canada forever and ever, and they're happy. Other people, you know, want to be across the world. So. I don't know. I'd have no musical talent whatsoever, so I'm just I'm living I'm living vicariously through you today. <laughs> the pro the problem with the Canadian um, Canadian platform, like you're saying, is is that it's it's always seen as the little brother of the U.S. and that that's the problem. And unfortunately, if you're only big in Canada, 
people like the rest of the rest of the world mm -hmm. thinks like oh okay. it's a Juno not a Grammy right right, okay. right. Got it. so unless until you elevate the value of Canadian overall Canadian culture overall and mm -hmm. arts overall it, it, it won't be on the same level as the US. Do you example. think a contributing factor to raising the value of Canadian arts and culture would be not to just see it develop in terms of a mainstream? Um, or I guess it needs it, its own voice. Yeah, it needs Absolutely. its own depth, you know, That's because the, I think Justin yeah. Bieber and Drake are adding a certain element, but at the, the same time, is, there's so much more to us. I know, and the thing is also, you know, people who don't know that they're Canadian would say, oh, but that sounds American. That's the thing, we, ha we, don't have a, we haven't really developed a Canadian identity. Mm -hmm. Pop music is American right. music, basically. Exactly. Pop Canadian music is pop American music. But, so we don't have a sound. And Bieber and Drake are perfect examples of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Bieber was busking outside in Stratford till Usher saw him on YouTube and he, got, he gave him label backing in the States. Right. Drake was independent until Wayne saw him and then he hooked up with Lil Wayne's crew. So it's like, I mean, even like from Jim Carrey, if you like, Every major Canadian artist that has international acclaim left Canada. Left Canada. Yeah. Okay. And is that, is that, could that be a reason why Canada is not creating this sound or this voice or this identity? It is. The, I think we're, losing, we're losing our artists to the other countries, or the say, say the U.S. But <laughs> a good animator yeah. makes the two guests, yeah. you know, <laughs> riff. Go ahead. <laughs> but, but I'll say, but see, here, again, I, I don't... I don't care. I've been talking smack about these things for a long time. I'll just say it. Yeah. People leave Canada because they don't feel supported. And just here's a basic example. Do you guys know that the Juno Award for Hip Hop used to be presented on commercial break up until like three years ago? Oh, wow. Do you know this? Didn't know that. They used to give out, I mean, and if you look at like the numbers that Drake is doing or that or or urban artists are doing, urban artists in Canada or in the world really are the ones driving the music industry. And there's still such disrespect towards them. They were handing out the award. You know, like the, the notion that, I don't know, Billy Talent or Alex is on fire is outselling Drake is hysterical. Mm -hmm. Yet you watch the Junos and they have like the Arkells are headlining. As, and, and Drake's not there. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I feel like if Canada wants urban artists or, or diverse performers to stay within the industry, they need to respect urban artists and promote it as though we are major players, which we have been for a long time. Okay. I'm going to now go into politics. I'll, I'll stay here. I'll stay <laughs> local. Open that can of worms. Slav. Cancelled. Rightfully so. <laughs> <laughs> However, as um, artists from who could represent diversity, what was your personal impression of that? I mean, as a as a as a as a ticket buyer, black woman, I have my own opinions. But as an artist who probably could have contributed to that type of production, what is your take generally on Slav as an artist? You want to go first? <laughs> this, is, this is your field though too. I'll, I'll go in on this. They can cancel that whole thing. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, you gotta be stupid in 2018 to do a show called Slav about Negro spirituals inspired by you know, African American uh, slavery and hire predominantly white people who are essentially in blackface, right? If you watch the pictures from that, they had these people dressed up in like headscarves like they were African slaves mm -hmm. singing the song. You gotta be stupid. And this is the thing that is very, in my opinion, unique to Quebec. And people don't realize when you step out, like living in BC now, you step outside the bubble. I was showing my American, like my New York theater friends, talking to them about Slav. Mm -hmm. And they were like, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, this dude, this big Quebec producer is doing mm -hmm. a show about with Negro spirituals with white people. And they're like, but is it a joke? Is it like <laughs> The Onion? They didn't understand, right. They didn't understand. And, and then you even look, uh, Théâtre Rideau Vert does an end of year show every year where they have black celebrities represented by white people in blackface. Every year. Okay. And, and my, friend, like my boy Quincy is the artistic director of Black Theatre Workshop. Mm -hmm. Every year, the members of the black community go, you can't do blackface, guys. Right. And there's a significant number of Quebec artists who don't understand this and who are arguing with them. So I think someone like Lepage has the resources and the experience to know better. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna do a show about someone else's culture, you have to include people of that culture in the producing of it and the performing of it. So is Slav a purple unicorn or like something that it has taken the world by surprise? Or is, this, is it just an exposed a feature of what artistry or what artists sometimes go through in terms of ex direct exclusion from, from things that it would be obviously almost like a shoe in right? Like I think of the amount of artists and singers and people who could have been involved in that production or probably others 
and the fact that they were flagrantly disregard. Is that, is that the name of the game, but this one just got a lot of press? In Canada, and specifically Quebec, it is emblematic of a mentality that is ubiquitous in Quebec culture. Okay. Try doing that in New York. Right. Well, it was slated to go. Oh, I would have loved to see it. Do it in, Har <laughs> do it in Harlem. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would love to see them open that shit. Like, it's right. just funny. Like, it's such a bubble here. They don't even realize how okay. embarrassing it is. Right. But I think that it, it did open the door to what's happening behind closed doors a lot of the time. Okay. Um, I don't know about other industries so much, but in music, for example, you know, the Quebec, um, the industry of music in Quebec here is very clicky. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just today, just to prepare for this, I was doing a little Wikipedia, you know, search on right. a disc which is the, um, the gala for um, basically the music industry gala in Quebec. In Quebec, right. Um, kind of like a mini Junos, which is a mini Grammys. Right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and you know, I was looking at all the nominees that were from the last, uh, the last whatever, uh, awards time. I just looked down the first 50 names. Two of them were non-Quebecer names, mm -hmm. you know, just to give you an example. And I think that, I don't know how much of this is, you know, very, done on purpose or it's really just a matter of, you know, systemic because everyone, you know, gets into that disc based on the people they know and so on. And so that the music that they know is all the other people that they know right. and so on and so forth. So it just becomes hard to break through mm -hmm. if you're, you know, a minority in Quebec or even an Anglophone in Quebec, right? If you're an Anglophone in Quebec, you're, you're still a minority. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Double minority status. Yeah. Okay. And if I can jump in on sure. that, you guys remember a few years ago there was the Oscars So White campaign yes. that exposed systemic uh, discrimination in the Oscars. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to look no further than the people sitting behind the scenes on these awards or on these showcases. In the case of the Oscars, they mm -hmm. found out that it was, I don't know the exact numbers, but the overwhelming me majority of members of the Academy were white and male and over the age of 60. Right. So of course, if you're choosing what you think the best movie is, and you look at the demographic who's voting for it. I mean, right. if you took mostly 15-year-old black women, you know, mm -hmm. Girls Trip would win Best Picture. Right. right. <laughs> you know exactly. Yeah, exactly. And we're, I think that's how, how you have to look at things when you're like, why, is, why does this exist? Just look at who's making the decisions. Okay. My last question would be the, um, so the word is in French in my head, la relève. So the next, the next wave, the next generation uh, in, in music and arts and how do you see yourself contributing to that? I know you guys are still full into the course of your careers, but mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you see, foresee your contribution being to keep your craft or your art or your genre alive? For me, um, so I'm a piano teacher. Right, so you I'm you know, hopefully training the next generation, um, giving them some exposure to music. And you know, I'm still writing music as well. I'm on my fourth album right now. Um, and you know, my plan is to throw all the stereotypes out the window. I don't want anyone to assume anything about me. Mm -hmm. you, know? you don't know where I come from, you don't know what I've been through, but hopefully all that comes out through my music and I don't, and I don't wanna pigeonhole myself into any one place. Um, and you know, I have some big projects in mind as well, hopefully as a collaboration with Overture of the Arts, maybe uh, another, reviving the singer-songwriter competition for young people. Mm -hmm. That would be another um, great way if we can get that going on a yearly basis mm -hmm. to really encourage young people in Montreal, in Quebec, in Canada to pursue their dreams in the arts. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah, I think uh, there's this important concept of sending the, the elevator back down, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's, if you achieve any type of success, whether it's helping out through mentorship or just cutting a check sometimes, like paying for someone's CD or paying right. for their, I think it's important for artists who, even if you're not established, wherever you're at, sending the elevator back down to help somebody reach where you're at will make all of us stronger. So. Great. Yeah, great. Mm. Well, this has been a great conversation. I want to give, uh, well, do you want to give them a round of applause for the great interview? <laughs>